When one wishes to talk about great scientific families, there are more than a few names that come to the fore. There is, of course, the Herschel family, beginning with William, the discoverer of Uranus, and his sister Caroline, followed by his eminently famous and productive son John, who was both a friend and collaborator of William Ewell. John would have three scientifically famous sons, Alexander, William, and John the Younger, and it would be Alexander who would be among the first or the earliest users of fingerprints as unique identifiers, while the latter two would both be elected as fellows of the Royal Society for their astronomical work. There were the Bernoullis of Basel, who produced no fewer than eight mathematicians and engineers who would work in areas as diverse as the establishment of probability theory and fluid dynamics. In Denmark, there were the Bohrs, Niels and his son Alga, both of whom would win Nobel Prizes for their work in physics, not to mention Niels brother Harald, who did groundbreaking work in the mathematical field of what is known as almost periodic functions. Similarly, we can think of the Curies, husband and wife Pierre and Marie, who would share a Nobel Prize, and whose daughter Irene would then go on later to share a prize with her husband, Pierre Gillot. Of course, there are the Darwins, whose influence in England is still significant to this very day, and from India, one can marvel at the contributions of the extended family from which C. V. Raman and Subrayaman Chandrasekhar come. We've covered many of these individuals in previous episodes of the Odyssey, but hitheretofore we have neglected what may be the most enduring family of them all. While the Herschels would also earn noble title or obtain noble title for their work that was done scientifically, none of the families can be said to have had as long an influence as the four generations that served and then survived the kings of France. I am, of course, talking about the Cassini dynasty that spanned from 1625 to 1845 and that would explore the heavens and map the globe with a precision that no one had previously. With roots that reach back to Galileo in northern Italy, the Cassinis would be a scientific force of nature that would both redefine how we measure the earth and who would also wrestle with the errors of Isaac Newton about the true shape of our planet. In this episode of the Scientific Odyssey, we will trace their rise from the back country of Nice to the height of noble privilege and ancien regime, and finally to a fall brought about by the tides of revolution. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Way. Episode 53, The Cassini Dynasty. To quote from the inimitable Mike Duncan, it's been a while. I know. I have to tell you that moving across the country is one heck of a thing. I'll speak a bit more about it at the end of this episode, but the Odyssey has finally found a new berth here on the southern end of the Colorado Plateau in Flagstaff, Arizona. While we're still settling in and unpacking boxes, I finally got the various audio equipment liberated and set up in a space where I could produce an episode. As a trial run, I thought I would share with the crew an expanded version of a talk I gave at the summer meeting of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers back in mid-July. Before I get started, I want to offer my sincere thanks to Dr. Richard Schmoody for extending the invitation to speak and to the organization for so graciously welcoming me as their guest. It was a wonderful evening of history and conversation, one I would love to repeat. So, as I asked the gathered observers and citizen scientists that evening, a month or so ago, 
Come back with me now to the year 1625. In that year, James VII of Scotland, who was also James I of the United Kingdom, would die, passing his throne to his ill-fated son, Charles I. In France, Louis XIII was fighting the Huguenots led by the Duke of Sobis. The Dutch, for their part, were settling a small outpost on Manhattan Island in the New World and near in Africa, the capital of Madagascar, was being founded by King Adrian Jaca. In that year, several prominent figures would die, including the great German astronomers Simon Marius and Johann Baer, while others would be born to high estate and privileged. Unnoticed among these noteworthy events was the birth on June 8th of a boy in the village of Perinaldo in the county of Nice in what was then the Duchy of Savoy. Named Giovanni by his parents, Jacopo Cassini of Tuscany and Giulia Corvesi of Nice, he wasn't raised in their home, but rather by his maternal uncle, a man of better means, connections, and most importantly, access to education. The young Cassini spent two years in a school in Valbonne, before moving to a Jesuit-run school in Genoa, where he showed great intellectual promise. Excelling in poetry, astronomy, and mathematics, he soon matriculated to the Abbey at San Fructoso, where he was attracted to astrology, at least until reading Pico della Mirandola's work attacking the subject as nothing more than frivolous pseudoscience. Turning instead to purely astronomical pursuits, he soon attracted the attention of, the, of a local nobleman, the Marquis Cornelio Malvasia, who, rather ironically, had read some of Cassini's early writing on astrology and had been very impressed by his intellect and his insight. Malvasia was an astrologically inclined senator from Bologna who had the money and the ego to build a world-class observatory and then staff it with some of the best astronomers in Italy. Of course, for him, it was to sort of feed that astrological interest. That doesn't mean the men that he hired followed his inclinations. While Cassini wasn't originally hired in the role of working astronomer at the Panzano Observatory by the Astrology and Levy Marquis, he was independent enough to, in 1644 at the age of 19, to spend as much time as he could with those who were hired as working astronomers. Over the next four years, he learned from the likes of Giovanni Baptiste Riccioli and Francesco Maria Grimaldi. As you may recall from an episode we devoted to him, Riccioli was a Jesuit priest who worked to confirm a number of Galileo's observations as well as to quantify his law of falling bodies with a series of incredibly accurate observations. Grimaldi, who we have left unmentioned in our journeys, also did incredibly important work, specifically in optics, eventually discovering the phenomenon we now call diffraction. As you might expect, with the amount of talent Cassini possessed and the tutelage of Italy's two greatest living astronomers, it wasn't long before the young man began producing his own astrological, astronomical, I should say, work. In November 1647, the professor of astronomy at the University of Bologna, Bonaventura Calaveri, who was a fascinating figure, by the way, in the history of mathematics, died, and with the Marquis as his patron, Cassini was appointed as his successor. At about the same time, in early 1648, Cassini was able to sort of purchase, using the Marquis' funds, a number of upgraded instruments for the observatory, where he maintained his appointment. With his newfound status and equipment, he quickly set out to make a number of observations of the motion of a comet in 1652. The publication of these results established him as being one of among Italy's most elite scientific figures. To quote the complete Dictionary of Scientific Biography, quote, In 1652 and 1653, the passage of a comet attracted his attention. In the account of his observations, he accepted that the Earth is at the center of the universe, that the moon possesses an atmosphere, and that the comets, which are situated beyond Saturn, are formed as a result of emanations originating from the Earth and the planets. End quote. It is here that we need to note the beginning point of what would be a long and interesting journey of Cassini's. Having been trained by Riccioli and Grimaldi, Cassini had inherited both their incredible commitment to accuracy and observation and deep suspicion of new and radical ideas. As such, at this point, it would be fair to say that Cassini was 
devoutly Ptolemaic and Aristotelian in his cosmological views. In fact, even as Riccioli would move towards a more advanced set of ideas, Cassini was still thinking in a pre-Galilean and pre-Keplerian way. It's at this point that a rather fortunate happenstance interjected itself into Cassini's life. One of the things I should remind you of is that at this point in Europe, good timekeeping devices were really hard to come by. As you may recall from earlier episodes, Galileo is said to have used rhythmic chants of local monastics or a sort of water drop timer to do his experiments on rolling objects because he didn't have anything nearly as accurate as that to measure time with. Similarly, where Riccioli had refined these measuring tools somewhat, they were still limited in their ability to actually tell time with great accuracy. So, the, the question arises, how did folks back then keep time? As had been the case in the medieval Islamic world, the people of Italy relied on the religious institutions, namely the local churches, to keep track of the passing of the hours. One of the ways a church could do this was to create something like a modified gnomon. Instead of using a stick to cast a shadow on the ground, what a church would do is have a hole made in the south-facing wall of the church. This hole would act a bit like a pinhole camera or a camera, ob camera obscura and project an image of the sun onto the floor of the church. The floor then would be marked, beginning with a line running north to south, what we might call a meridian, and then with additional markings that acted as sort of a reverse sundial. In this way, this whole system could act as a sort of clock during the daylight hours, but also as a calendar by marking the position of the sun's image on the north-south line at noon. The higher the sun was in the sky at noon, the closer to the wall the image of the sun would be. By keeping track of the image's position, the local capris could determine approximate dates for the solstices and equinoxes, and thus keep the solar calendar in sync. So what does this all have to do with Giovanni? Well, back in 1575, his predecessors, Professor of Astronomy in Bologna, had built such a gnomon system for the local church of San Petronio, or St. Peter, there in Genoa. The problem was that as Bologna had grown, and had become a cultural and economic center, the church had grown and expanded as well, until the structural modifications required to keep the church able to house its congregation had blocked the old gnomon system. The church, understandingly, understandably not wanting to lose the instrument's functionality, decided to go back to the university to see if the new chair there might be able to build them a new one. While well, the plan that Cassini developed in response to this request was daunting in its execution, he was able to make the very precise calculations necessary and just as importantly oversee the engineering and construction challenges so that the instrument worked perfectly. Having been so involved in its creation, Cassini then began training the priests to make precise scientific observations and measurements for him for those times when he couldn't be at the church to make them himself. Most importantly, in making these observations, he was able to measure not only the location of the image on the north-south meridian, but also its size with better precision than had been previously achieved. This allowed him to calculate a number of astronomical kind of figures, pieces of data, observations, and all sorts of things that really were very helpful. Things such as the obliquity of the ecliptic, as well as, you know, a more precise determination of the dates and times of solstices and equinoxes, as was previously mentioned. He would publish a compilation of this work in 1656 that would be dedicated to Queen Christina of Sweden, who was in exile in Tuscany at the time. He would return to these measurements at a later time in his life in a really very important way. For the next decade, though, Cassini would be tasked with settling a number of territorial disputes for the papacy and would struggle to continue to really engage in the, in the full flower of his scientific work. Instead, he published a number of works on engineering, specifically in the areas of hydraulics and hydrology. During this time, however, we see an interesting transition in Cassini's thinking about cosmology. In 1659, he published a paper that indicated that he had moved from a Ptolemaic view of the universe to a Tychonic one. This was likely due to a better understanding of Galileo's work showing that the observations of the phases of Venus are completely incompatible with Ptolemy's model. 
By 1664, it seems that he had to move to at least seriously considering a Keplerian model of the solar system based both on additional cometary observations as well as working with the data collected from the gnomon at San Petronio. What seems to be clear was that the traditional Tychonic system could not adequately explain the changes in the image size of the sun observed from the floor of the church. What is unclear from my research is whether Cassini did move to heliocentrism completely or decided to adopt a modified Tychonic system that made the orbit of the sun around the earth elliptical, mirroring the elliptical planetary orbits of the Keplerian system. While it would have been interesting to see how Cassini's thought might have continued to evolve, technology once again changed the course of his research in that same year of 1664. At that time, Cassini, now in the role of head astronomer at Panzano, had struck a friendship with two of Italy's best lens makers, Giuseppe Campani and Eustochio Davini. Working in conjunction with these two great craftsmen, Cassini was able to install what would be the best telescopes of his age. Over the course of the next four years, he would report a number of startling observations that would amaze the astronomical world. And just to give you a sense of the time frame here, these years bracket the time when Isaac Newton was a student at Trinity College, Cambridge. John Flamsteed was, the first, was first taking the reins of the new Royal Observatory in Greenwich, and the fledgling Royal Society was just being granted its charter. Due to the increased magnification of the telescopes, and more importantly, the better resolution they offered, along with better mounts, Cassini was able to, for the first time, see various features on several planets. His first target was Jupiter, where he used a feature observed earlier in the year by Robert Hooke to measure the rotation rate of the planets. One of the interesting questions here is whether that feature that both Hooke and then Cassini observed was in fact the great red spot that we observe today. While it has long been assumed that these observations were of the same object that Galileo had observed, as well as the storm system an observer can see with a modest, modest amateur telescope today, a lack of observational continuity calls such a conclusion into question. Following Cassini's last observations in 1712, just before he died, there seems to be a lack of observation of any sort of system of this kind until around 1830. Additionally, the dynamics and position of the feature Cassini observed as compared to what had been seen from 1830 onward calls into question whether those two things are in fact the same. In any case, whatever that feature was, using it allowed Cassini to be able to determine Jupiter's rotation period, which he calculated to be about 9 hours and 56 minutes, which by the way is less than a minute off the presently measured value. Cassini was then able to see surface features on Mars, first observed by his mentors Riccioli and Grimaldi, and most recently refined by Christian Huygens. Most likely using the feature known as Citrus Major Planum, he was able to refine Huygens' measurements of Mars rotations to a period of 24 hours and 40 minutes, a mere three minutes from its presently accepted value. Additionally, he seems to have been the first person who have actually observed the southern polar ice cap on Mars for the first time. It was really quite an amazing run. In fact, in the years between 1664 and 1668, Panzano would have seemed to most of the European scientific community as sort of a factory of astronomical discuss discovery with Cassini working at the forges. One of the most intriguing set of observations Cassini made during this time had to do with the moons of Jupiter. And this, by the way, this, this sort of story gives us great insight into Cassini's character as a scientist, or perhaps it would be better to say at this date, you know, a natural philosopher. The moons of Jove had, of course, been first observed by Galileo, who had characterized their motions in enough detail to suggest a way in which they could be used to determine a person's longitude on Earth through the timing of various passages in front and behind the planet. While the Tuscan astronomer had been unable to do this with enough accuracy to convince anyone of his method, Cassini believed in the fundamental validity of the procedure, and so with his better instruments, he worked to redo Galileo's observations and calculations. What he found, however, while the, was that while the method did work, there seemed to be a little bit of an error in the measurements, a sort of delay when he saw the moon first pass in front of or behind the planet. 
Moreover, he recognized that this delay was dependent as to whether he was making these observations of Jupiter at what we call opposition, when Jupiter is on the same side of the uh, sun as the Earth is, and thus due south in the sky at midnight, or if he was making those observations at near what we call conjunction, which is that point when Jupiter is much closer to the sun in the sky, meaning that, at least in a heliocentric model, it would have been on the opposite side of its orbit. What Cassini really noticed is that when he looked at this delay in the time of an event, whether that was, you know, the moon going in front of Jupiter, what we might call an occultation, or the moon going behind Jupiter, and what we would call an eclipse, what he noticed is that that delay was significantly smaller at opposition, when Jupiter, I should say, was at opposition, than when Jupiter was at conjunction. Puzzled at first, Cassini seems to have recognized that the results were consistent with a hypothesis that said that light, if it traveled with a finite speed, would take longer to reach the Earth from an eclipsing moon if Jupiter were further away from the Earth, as would be the case in the, the, when you had a conjunction taking place, as opposed to when Jupiter was in opposition. Now, this is a really huge result. Now, before Cassini, there had been those who had suggested that light might travel with a finite speed, most notably Galileo. But this, this, this thing that Cassini had discovered was really sort of physical evidence that such a thing is actually taking place. And this was the first time that had been done. Unfortunately, though, Cassini was far too conservative to embrace such a radical explanation. Whether this was because of some ideological bias or a lingering belief in an Earth-centered universe is hard to tease out, but Cassini, while noting the explanation in his personal journals, chose not to publish anything more than just his data. Fortunately, though, he did publish that, and so it was that 10 years later, Ole Romer would use Cassini's data, along with some that he had gathered, to suggest that very same thing and to give an estimate for the speed of light, a number that's within about 10% of today's accepted value. It was a missed opportunity caused by Cassini's deep-seated intellectual and scientific conservatism. While it wouldn't be the last time his instinct would land him on the wrong side of a scientific issue, it still should be said that it you know, we really shouldn't take away from the absolutely amazing observational work he had done and had had the integrity to publish. You know, it's amazingly precise observations that Cassini made that allowed Romer to have sort of figured everything out. Without that data, he likely would have missed the phenomenon. So this really incredibly productive period brought Cassini to the attention of the most powerful man in Europe. Louis XIV, the Sun King. Seeing the advances in science in general, and astronomy in particular, both in Italy and Britain, Louis resolved that France should not fall behind its rivals in terms of scientific prestige. As such, in addition to founding the Academy of Sciences, he commissioned the founding of a great observatory on the outskirts of Paris. To assist with this, he asked Cassini to come and serve as, some, as a sort of, you know, outside consultant for the project. Well, at least that was the story. Given the way Cassini was wined and dined, as it were, it seems pretty likely that Louis was using the two-year consulting gig as an extended recruiting effort. And it was a recruiting effort that worked. After a few initial hiccups, Cassini was convinced to leave Bologna in 1670 to take up the de facto directorship of the Paris Observatory. Within a few years, he had changed his name to Jean Dominique and had taken a French wife, completing his transition to becoming a devout Francophile, embracing all things French, including a deep-seated Catholicism found in the country and engagement in the work of the Academy of Sciences. During this time, it was the ideas of Descartes and physics that were dominant, even as Newton was working in fits and starts between his alchemical investigations and forays into understanding biblical prophecy to sort out the details of his grand thesis, synthesis of gravitation and the laws of motion that would burst, burst forth in about a decade and a half. Cassini's years at the Paris Observatory continued to be tremendously productive ones. This is the period where he made the observations of Saturn for which he is best known. In the early 1670s, right after taking over in Paris, he announced the discoveries of two new moons of the planet, 
a feat he would repeat again in 1684. He would also observe that division of the rings that now bears his name, what's called the Cassini Division. In the paper announcing this observation, he would be the first to posit the hypothesis that the rings were actually made up of numerous small particles that orbited the planet independently, something that would be shown to be true mathematically some 170 years later by James Clerk Maxwell. What's interesting, however, is that as time went on, one could begin to see a new interest beginning to sort of creep into Cassini's work. It probably goes back to his research in 1668 on using the moons of Jupiter to determine longitude, but Cassini began to show real interest in the topic known as geodesy, the determination of the size and shape of the earth or some portion thereof, using a variety of means somewhat, sometime after that. Now, obviously, all of this has a good deal of overlap with what we now call physical geography. But at the time, as we've pointed out in previous episodes, this was all kind of lumped together under the broad heading of cosmography, uh, determining the order of all things, both terrestrial and celestial, in the universe. And so what we think of as cartography or geography was really melded with astronomy at this interesting intersection. The first important piece of work was Cassini's publication of a much improved tables of the motions of Jupiter's moon that allowed astronomers to establish the longitude of a number of ground-based locations with a fair degree of accuracy. For those locations that were part of French possessions or that hosted scientific teams from the Academy of Sciences, Cassini often served as the one who did the required calculations to determine what the longitude was. So useful was this, in fact, is for a while it was sort of put forward as a method of sort of solving what was known as the longitude problem as a way of if you could make observations of the moons of Jupiter from the ground and get your longitude, you should have been able to do that from the ship. The problem is, is that taking the types of measurements with the accuracy you need from the pitching deck of a ship just proves to be far too impractical. In 1672, Cassini also participated in what was actually a pretty revolutionary project with two colleagues, Jean Riker and Jean Picard. Riker traveled with a team to Cayenne in French Guiana, while Picard and Cassini remained in Paris. Both groups made very detailed measurements of the position of Mars with respect to the background stars and were able to determine the parallax effect of observing from two different positions on the Earth over the course of several months. This allowed for a very precise calculation of the distance between Earth and Mars over the course of those observations, thus allowing for a very good estimate of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, something known as an astronomical unit. So precise were the measurements that astronomers would be unable to reproduce them at the level of precision that the, the teams in, in Paris and in, in Cayenne had for a number of decades. And the value for the astronomical unit obtained would stand as the most accurate for almost 100 years until Halley's method of observing the transit of Venus was finally used in 1769 to get a better estimation of that distance. Interestingly, another result that Riker brought back with him was an observation made with a simple pendulum. Now, a simple pendulum is basically just a, a light string. If you'd like today, think of, you know, just high tensile fishing, you know, fishing wire or something like that with a small but somewhat substantial mass attached to the end of that string. If you attach the, the free end of the string to a fixed point and then pull the mass at the other end of the string to the side a small amount, the time it takes for the pendulum to make one swing or oscillation will depend only on the length of the string. Well, at least that's what most folks thought when Galileo had first made the observation back in the 1500s. Since that time, though, it had been observed that if you took a pendulum further away from the center of the Earth, i.e. up a mountain, the period it would take to make an oscillation for a given length of string would get longer, meaning that to get the same period that you had measured with that pendulum at sea level, you'd actually have to shorten the string or shorten the pendulum. What Riker had observed in French Guiana was that what you had to do is you had to use a shorter pendulum than you did in Paris to be able to get a swing that took one second. Thus, he reasoned his location, which was closer to the equator than Paris was, had to be further away from the center of the earth, as was the case on the mountain. Now, 
As we've done before in these sorts of situations, let's pause and recognize just how cool an experiment and result this is or was. Riker had probably sort of stumbled upon it as he tried to calibrate his equipment in order to take the Mars measurements, and he kept finding a sort of systematic error in his test data. Now, instead of throwing his hands up or just covering up the slight discrepancy, you know, and saying it wasn't a big deal, he tracked down the issue and determined that the pendulum he was using to keep time was running just a bit slow. If his notes are correct, he had to shorten the string by about 1% to get it to swing once per second again. And I think that's pretty impressive dedication to both precision and accuracy in scientific work. Now, you'd think Cassini would have been pleased with this information when Riker returned to Paris in 1673, but not so much. Again, for whatever reason, Cassini's scientific conservatism led him to disagree with his colleague. The reason for this was that if Riker was right in saying that the points closer to the equator were further from the center of the Earth, that would mean that the Earth had to be flattened at the poles. Now, in my research, I've come across two different positions that Cassini might have preferred to this sort of a, a model. One was that he believed that the Earth should be a perfect sphere, as would have been the dogma in the Catholic Church at the time. The other is that perhaps, or that actually is the case, is that Descartes' physics predicted that the Earth's interaction with the various vortices that Descartes claimed filled space should have caused the Earth sort of to have been squished at the equator and thus elongated at the poles. Both of these, of course, disagreed with Riker's conclusions, and so Cassini wanted to gather additional data, data that he would be sure would concern, confirm a different theory. As to exactly which theory, I still haven't been able to track that down yet. Now, before we move on here, a word is in order so that we don't seem to be pillorying Cassini too much. Yes, he had a preferred model. And even if I haven't been able to quite ferret that out, which one that might have been, it's really interesting and it should be noted that he doesn't just dismiss Riker's data out of hand. Riker's work on measuring the position of Mars had been top-notch and to make it seem as if he had made some error would have invalidated the entire project. So instead, Cassini kind of thought that there must be some other explanation for that difference in period of the pendulum, and so he sought to gather data using another method, one that would sort of directly measure the Earth itself. In other words, what he thought was going on was it wasn't because the Earth's shape was sort of flattened at the poles that was causing, you know, Riker's data to 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 be the way it was instead he thought there was some other factor you know maybe there was some anomaly in in cayenne there that that caused the gravitation to be a little different or something like that but what he figured was is that if he could find a different way to measure basically in a sense the shape of the earth that didn't require him to use something like a pyramid an indirect method that would give him more reliable data now, what Cassini recognized was that if, if the Earth was a perfect sphere, a degree of latitude would be the same physical distance along the surface of the Earth, whether near the equator or near the pole. However, if the Earth were either flattened or elongated at the pole, then the distances measured, say one near the equator and one near the pole, the distances should be different. Hence, what he proposed to do was to measure a longitude line that ran from, or ran through Paris from the meridian up to the North Sea using the surveying techniques that had first been suggested by Jim Afrisius in 1553 and then later put into practice using some more modern surveying tools by Willebrod Snell in 1615. It would be a project that would sort of progress in fits and starts beginning in 1684 and it would go on into the 17s across multiple generations of the Cassini family. Now, during this time, Newton would, in fact, publish the Principia in 1687, and in it, he would derive the result that due to its rotation on its axis, the Earth would be flattened at its poles, something that, by the way, Cassini had actually observed to be the case with Jupiter. In support of this result, Newton has referenced Riker's data. 
However, in 1700, Cassini, now working with his son, whom we shall speak of here in a moment, would publish data from his meridian survey on that segment of the meridian from Paris to Perpignan to the south that suggested exactly the opposite. Thus was born a shape of the earth controversy that we shall have ample opportunity to address in later episodes of the podcast. It is appropriate at this point, I think, to introduce Jacques Cassini, Jean-Dominique's second son. In doing this, by the way, I, I plan to follow a practice often seen when discussing the four-generation-long Cassini dynasty, especially once they get a hold of the Paris Observatory, and I will begin to refer to the various neighbor members according to the generational number, kind of as if they were royalty. Hence, Giovanni, or John dominique after he moves to France, will be Cassini I, while Jacques is often referred to as Cassini II. This will actually be really helpful as when we go through the generations, the family begins to recycle names between various sons, and so this just sort of helps us keep everything, everything straight. Born in 1677 as his father's second son, just a few years after he'd moved to France, Jacques showed an early interest in and aptitude for scientific work. And so when he was 18, after some schooling kind of carried on through the Paris Observatory, he accompanied his father back to Bologna to see to repairs and renovations of the Gnomon at San Petronio, sometime around 1895. From that point on, he was a partner in his father's labors, and by 1707 he was more or less running the observatory, as Cassini I's eyesight had begun to fail. In 1712, when his father died, Jacques was appointed as head of the Paris Observatory, a post he would hold until his death in 1756. In this, his oversight of the observatory coincides closely with the reign of Louis XV. During this period, Cassini II can be thought of as being very much his father's son, in that he continued to carry out the same research program that made measurements of the various moons of the planets and focused on sort of measuring out both the kingdom of France as well as the broader shape of the Earth. In this first area, Cassini published a set of tables for Saturn's moons in 1716 that was a companion to the work of his that his father had produced for Jupiter. Of course, in many ways, the second work was actually much harder one than the first as the moons of Saturn are much harder to distinguish and make good measurements of than those of Jupiter owing to the fact that Saturn is nearly twice the distance from the Earth than Jupiter is. This effort was truly a first-rate scientific work, even if it wasn't truly groundbreaking in a scientific sense. It was very much what Thomas Kuhn would 250 years later, referred to as normal science, but really well done normal science. Just as important as this astronomical work was Jacques' continuation of the measuring of France. Working with his father, the two men were able to get a much better sense of the size of France through the use of the surveying methods we briefly mentioned earlier. In fact, somewhat caustically, Louis XIV, before his death, would remark that the Cassinis had cost him more of his kingdom than he had won in all of his wars. And the reason for this was that their data showed that France was actually about 20% smaller than it had been previously thought. In time, all of the surveying activity would traverse out these great lines, these great reaches across the length and breadth of the country of France at various latitudes and longitudes, or meridians, that would serve to better establish the boundaries of the realm and its subordinate parts. One important piece of this work would be his continued involvement in the debate on the true shape of the earth. Discarding the perfectly spherical model, Cassini II would vehemently disagree with those who believed it was the analysis, or believed first the analysis of Christian Huygens and then Isaac Newton as being the correct description of the Earth's shape. His data showed that um, that just wasn't the case. 
He had sort of taken all this data, the stuff he had gathered from the Meridian Line Survey from Dunkirk through Paris to Perpignan, and it really did seem to show, at least in his estimation, that the Earth was elongated at the poles. Unfortunately, these data contained enough random uncertainty that the distance between the ends of the survey wasn't long enough, it wasn't big enough, to truly establish that his results were valid. Lacking the tools of modern statistical analysis of uncertainty that wouldn't be developed for another century, Jacques assigned too much certainty to his averages and arrived at what would ultimately prove to be the wrong results. This would be shown to be true by one of the greatest expeditions of his time when the French Academy of Sciences sent two teams, one to Lapland and the other to Peru, to measure the distance of one degree of latitude and compare them with the measurements taken with the Cassini surveys. While Jacques would never accept the results of this work, it was, for most scholars, the definitive proof that the Earth was flattened at its poles due to the rotation in its axis. We'll have a great deal more to say about this later in the podcast series here on geography, where we'll really go into that in a lot of detail. Late in his career, Cassini II would publish a treatise on proper motion that complemented Edmund Halley's work on the subject. Additionally, over this period of years, he would contribute papers on subjects as wide-ranging as electricity, the function of barometers, ballistics, and reflective optics. As had been the case with his life, it would be his second son who would succeed him as director of the Paris Observatory upon his death in 1756 due to a carriage accident on the family's property in Turi. This third Cassini to lead the observatory was therefore Cassini du Turi, as he was titled, or César François, as he was known to his friends. Cassini III spent a good portion of his scientific life working in the shadow of his father, and so focused on the defining issue of his time, geodesy and geography. While he did assist his father in trying to resolve the geodesy question, a great deal more importance to him, and thus a great deal more of his effort, went into producing a complete and accurate map of France for the first time. Published in two works, the first in 1775 and the second in 1784, only a few years before the, re the revelation of the financial crisis that would eventually lead to the French Revolution, this map was the first topical, or I should say topographical map of an entire country that had been published in Europe. In addition to this, Cassini III developed a new type of map projection. As we'll discuss down the road a bit, one of the problems with producing maps of large regions of the Earth is you have to figure out how to represent the surface of a sphere on a two-dimensional plane. And in order to do this, the cartographer has to distort the geographic features of the Earth in some way. If you've ever looked at a typical Mercador projection map, you'll notice that while it does a good job of representing geographic features closer to the equator, the further you get towards the poles, the more distorted the land masses become, specifically getting much larger than their actual physical size on the globe. Greenland is nowhere near as large as South America in reality, but the Mercator projection shows it that way due to the distortions that it introduces. Cassini III's new projection allowed cartographers to better represent these regions closer to the poles than Mercator is good, and thus, for a time, was very useful for those seeking to explore in those areas. While Cassini III would serve as head of the Paris Observatory from 1756 until his death of smallpox in 1784, and he would be actually named its first official director in 1771, his leadership was, well, lackluster to say the least. He was really a geodesist and a geographer and a cartographer, but he was not an observer and he was not an astronomer. And so, like many of the institutions of France during Louis XV's reign, the observatory languished and fell into a state of marginal repair, bordering at times on just outright disrepair. Now, upon his death, the directorship, which had basically become a hereditary title of ennoblement in Ancien Regime France, it passed to his son, Jean-Dominique, or to avoid confusion with his great-grandfather, Cassini IV. This last Cassini of the dynasty was a much better astronomer than his father, and he also had a good bit more energy as well. 
He had traveled overseas extensively, specifically to test the chronometer solution to the longitude problem, and had returned with an understanding that France was falling far behind its competitors in both scientific progress and economic viability. As such, while working for his father, he continued the process of creating and publishing the complete map of France, and in 1787, he was tasked with working with the British Royal Observatory to accurately measure the distance between it and the Paris Observatory. In this, he enlisted the help of Pierre Michon and Adrien Marie Legendre, as well as using the border repeating circle as a surveying tool for the first time. Now, those listeners who remember our episode on the development of the first metric system will recognize those names as well as the tools they used. In a sense, this surveying project would serve as the trial run for what was known as the meter survey that would eventually establish the metric system, and that survey would begin in 1792. While he would serve as the time as the head of the meter survey mission, personal troubles, as well as the forces of the French Revolution, would soon see him resign his role. As you might expect, by this time the Cassini family was well ensconced in the feudalish or feudal like system that had governed France for centuries. Having acquired land, title, and noble privileges in addition to office, the Cassinis were both deeply loyal to the kings of France, now represented in the person of Louis XVI, and deeply conservative in their outlook on life and politics, economics, and any number of other things. As the developments in France following the 1789 beginning of the revolution and storming of the Bastille became more and more radical, Cassini IV began to find himself really hard-pressed. The breaking point, in a sense, came with the arrest and the imprisonment of Louis XVI in 1792. And so, in sort of outrage and just frustration with everything that was developing in, in France over this time, Cassini IV left his leadership post with the, the meter survey and just had sort of decided that he was just going to run the observatory and just have, and just sort of ride things out. However, everything would continue to spiral out of control, both nationally and personally, and it would be in 1793, just a year later, that Cassini IV would be stripped of his directorship of the observatory. The way this went is that the, the folks who were now running the country decided that having a single director was just far too autocratic, especially since that directorship seemed to be a hereditary title, and as they should strip noble privilege and hereditary titles out of the way, the decision was made, due to the protests of several students at the observatory, that the directorship should rotate. And so it was, there were four professorships that were created, Cassini was given one of those, but that directorship would re rotate between the professorships, notably from Cassini to these lesser, basically lesser abled students. Now, soon after that, in 1794, the maps of France that Cassini III and Cassini IV had worked so hard to produce were seized by sort of the directorate, and when Cassini IV protested that they had stolen his work, he was arrested and charged with treason. Fortunately, he was spared an appointment with Madame Guillotine when the new director of the observatory, one of those students we mentioned, was found to have falsified data and thus shown to be a fraud. However, traumatized by the events and no longer wishing to be a part of whatever might go on in Paris, Cassini took his family back to the estates in Thierry, where he would remain until his death in 1845. He would be the last Cassini to work at the Paris Observatory, and so it is here that our story ends. I hope you've enjoyed this brief digression that bridges these two series that we've been working on that cover the subjects of astronomy on one side and cartography on the other. I should be careful to note that while no other Cassinis did astronomy, at least that I know of, Cassini IV's son, Alexander Henri, became a botanist of some note. 
He made a name for himself studying various species of the sunflower and identifying several new genera of the species based on plants found mostly in North America. I've not been able to trace the family beyond that point, at least in scientific terms, but if there's anyone out there, any of you listeners, any of you members of the crew who have additional information on the Cassini family, let me know and I'll be happy to pass it along. You can always reach me at my email address, cldavies at mac.com, or leave me a note out on my Twitter feed. It'd be great to hear from you. As I mentioned at the outset of this episode, I really hope you'll forgive my long absence. It certainly wasn't for my wasn't my intention for the show to become Carlin-esque in its release schedule, but as mentioned, moving can be a huge thing. You know, beyond all the the logistics of organizing a 2,700-mile transportation from the east coast of the desert southwest, and I can assure you there was much logistical wrangling, there was the day-in and out work of just packing up our lives. You know, we lived in the same place for over 19 years, and you just accumulate a lot of stuff. And so there were literally hundreds of boxes that had to be packed each one with its own unique game, sort of 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 Tetris, trying to see what would fit and where, you know, boxes full of books, and you try to get as many books into the box without making it too heavy. If you've moved, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. All in all, it was just intellectually exhausting, and so I had little left to devote to the work of writing. While I'm still unpacking stuff here in Flagstaff, Arizona, and probably will be for a little while longer, I can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. And there is some organization beginning to take place, and so I've been able to get back to reading, writing, and producing the show. Look for the continuing content of the cartography series to resume here in the next couple of weeks. I'm really looking forward to getting back into this and resuming some level of normalcy. So, thanks for hanging in here with me. And until next time, full sails on your journey.